Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Arabian Business in Focus, where we speak to experts shaping industries and sectors here in the Middle East and across the globe. Joining us today, we have Alicia Mupin, the Deputy Managing Director of Asta DM Healthcare. Thank you, Alicia, for joining us here on the show today. Thank you, Anil. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Alicia, as the UAE healthcare sector becomes a model for medical tourism mm -hmm. in and around the world, how important is it for us to focus on affordability and accessibility um, here in the UAE? And what is ASTA doing in that realm? So brilliant question, and I think it's so timely, right? Because so far we've been talking about COVID and lockdowns, and it's great we're in a world now where everything's opened up, people are moving, people are traveling again. And one of the backlash from COVID has been there's been so many people who needed care, who didn't have access to care, because most of the hospitals across the world were so busy dealing with the pandemic. So it's ripe for medical tourism now, and we truly believe that UAE is extremely well-placed strategically to handle a large part of medical tourism patients. One, because of the locations. It's easily accessible. I think the aviation industry with Emirates, with Eteha, the kind of networks that we have to connect it to different parts of the world makes it a brilliant choice. Secondly is safety, right? I know you, one of the things we always talk about UAE is it really is one of the safest cities in the world, the safest country, safest city. I think Dubai was recently uh, noted as the 35th safest city in the world. And that's something which is really important when people are talking about leaving home and coming somewhere far away to get care. The last thing you want is not to be in a caring environment. I think that makes a big difference. In, of course, by default, the most important thing is the quality of care that is available, like you said. UAE has the largest number of JCI hospitals outside of even the US. Uh, the number of facilities that they have, the kind of infrastructure, the kind of medical talent that's come in from around the world is top notch. Uh, and I think there are benchmarks to support that. Recently, the US Newsweek has also incorporated UAE. We have a top 10 list of hospitals from here. So it all kind of endorses what the quality of uh, healthcare in this region is. Fifth and most interestingly, while the patient makes a choice about where you get the best care and the best doctors and the best technology, it's also very important to take care of the bystander who's coming with you. Are there options for them to do when someone is recovering, whether it's with rehab, sometimes procedures, you have to wait a week, 10 days, two weeks to go back and travel again. Uh, so here with the with the hospitality industry, with the entertainment industry, it, it makes it a very rich choice for even the bystanders. So it's a great combination between the connectivity, the technology, the quality of care, and the entertainment sector that makes it a very, very prime choice for medical tourism. That's a very succinct answer. Thank you, Alicia. From a business perspective, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm given to understand that um, Aster is operating across seven countries with 27 different hospitals, 120 clinics, sure. 317 odd pharmacies, and 66, um, if I'm not wrong, PECs and labs. Um, are you looking to expand or diversify the business any further? Yes, definitely we are. So we are a 35-year young company. Uh, but the whole idea started with how do we give the full spectrum of care that someone needs from the time they're born to, uh, till their last breath, right? So when you look at the way our company has evolved, it's always been about every touch point in healthcare that you require. And you need it for the sweetest of things like a delivery to the harshest of things when you're going through palliative care. And our model of care has been whatever the patient requires, we are able to serve it within the ASTA ecosystem. So we have uh, quite significant expansion plans. We always have grown 20 to 30% in the past, especially as India is taking off for us as well. There's a very rapid expansion that's happening in India, and there's a huge demand supply growth uh, in India. So we have almost year mark 900 crores over the next three years to set up quaternary care facilities, because over there, there is a requirement for much more beds to come in. Now, when you look at the GCC, it's slightly different. Where there are beds available, what we're trying to do here is make it more connected care. 
How is it that we can give patients choices or customers choices? People might not necessarily want to come to a clinic or a hospital for things that they don't need to come in for. So what we're trying to build out here is a much more uh, closer digital ecosystem where people have a choice between coming to a physical clinic or a hospital or meeting us digitally. So while we use the model also in India because there is a need for it, um, this is how we are kind of allocating the expansion plan where we're looking at much more connected care here between all the touch points and we're actually building out large hospitals in, in India. If I could extend on that conversation that you had around digital health, also we've seen that lessons learned from the pandemic are beginning to define a post-COVID world. Yeah. And some of these lessons involve uh, patients and people not wanting to wait in waiting rooms, for example, yeah. not wanting to take that long trip to the hospital. Um, in your opinion, on one hand, how is this driving telemedicine and digital health on one hand? And, and two, are you likely to see more investments in, say, omni-channel models of healthcare? No, brilliant question. And I think COVID has been, in hindsight, when you look at it, the only silver lining I see from COVID is kind of the push that it gave for telehealth and digital health, right? Because earlier we would always say it's not the same. Uh, people would always say you cannot, you're not connected to your patient, you don't have the care, the compassion. And there's always, uh, uh, you feel like you want the doctor to kind of examine you. Uh, and, and all of those kind of flew out of the window because we were forced to with the pandemic. So I think what's happened is as soon as the pandemic happened, we actually had almost 800 doctors, doctors of ours go online. Uh, we did more than 100,000 consultation in a six month period. So we saw people shifted to test it out. We've seen people be happy with that because it was convenient, it was easy. Post COVID, I think a lot of people were still gauging how things, would it regress back to what it was like before? Or would we actually move ahead in the same direction? And I think we saw it kind of get a little bit balanced out some people really preferred the new model continue to go online. And there are some people who went back to sort of norms as before. What we're trying to do is make it much more accessible, right? Yeah. We speak about accessibility for healthcare. There are limited doctors, there are limited nurses. Healthcare, uh, the challenge is the resources, not in terms of uh, capital allocation, but it's really about manpower allocation. And I think technology really makes you reach out to a lot more people. So the need of the hour is for us to make sure that we pivot and get the population to understand that this is the best model forward. It's the best model forward because it's the best use of resources. And it's the best model forward because it helps you reduce your cost of care. Right. And it should do that. The only uh, point that we have to be very mindful of within the healthcare industry is people are pumping in a lot of money into health tech. And the whole idea of healthcare is how do you give accessible and affordable care? You can't pump in so much money that it becomes unsustainable as well. Technology comes at a cost, but you have to figure out a way that it doesn't at the end reach the consumer and end up them bearing a higher cost. Um, one of the other very interesting things with the, uh, with the shift post-COVID, right? Everyone's become a lot more aware about their health. I think everyone is, they know what comorbidities did for right. people who got COVID, right? So people are much more clearer that they want to take better control and better care and better awareness of their health rather than figuring it out once they get sick, which is where, again, digital health health helps, right? You're connected to so many devices right now, whether it's Fitbit, whether it's Apple devices. How do we use this information to have much more meaningful decisions in our own life? Doctors can tell you lots of things, nurses, counselors, guides, right? But at the end, it's our own personal choice, how we discipline ourselves in our lives that's gonna take care of our health. Um, I think one of the things I was telling the team always is, we can blame our genes we can say, oh, it's because of my mom, my dad, and you know, we all do that. And we say that it, it loads the gun, but pulling the trigger happens with our own choices in life. But going back to uh, online consults, when you look at modalities like mental health, right? And again, post COVID, these are things we've seen what the stress is. And you know, some people are experienced post uh, traumatic stress. stress disorders. And mental health is something which again, people are m a lot more willing to talk about. 
online helps to give you the privacy, give you the comfort. Um, and those are long term sessions that you need month on month, week on week. So I think there are some where digital and online makes a lot of sense. And when it comes to surgeries and things, at the end, that's not going to change, right? That's not going to get disrupted. We still have to go into the hospital. The doctors are there. The surgeries need to happen. So depending on different modalities, I think digital is uh, makes a lot of sense in some, and it doesn't make sense in some. I'm going to pick your brains a little more along the same lines of what you were talking about, people becoming more aware of their comorbidities and acting on it. We're seeing that shift along the same lines of digital health, where people are becoming less based on reactive traditional modes of healthcare and moving more and asking more for a more proactive, personalized form of healthcare. Um, there are two ways of looking at this. One, from a business perspective, what opportunities does that create? And from a people perspective, how are we preventing people from becoming patients? Uh, it's, I think it's the hottest topic right now, right? Um, I think, uh, Anoop, when we talk about um, technology, things like the DNA. There's so much we don't know about ourselves, right? And earlier, you couldn't afford to spend $100,000 figuring out doing your DNA sequencing. Now you can do it for $100. Maybe that's affordable for 50% of the population, but you get to know what are your likely chances of a certain disease. If I know I'm predisposed to cardiovascular diseases or to uh, you know, joint issues, you make choices accordingly, right? So I think those are things which really empower us as patients and empower the health system as well to, to figure out the care management plan. Health has to be a continuous process. What made sense in 20 will not make sense in 30 and not in 40 and 60. Now we spend most of our life, I think there, I was reading a report the other day, it said for the first time in history, we are spending more time uh, of our life above 35 years, right? So, and those are very different because like 200 years ago, people were not living beyond 40, 45, 50, right? So how is it that we can knowingly make sure it's not only about the length of how much we are living, but how do you... Quality of life. Yeah, how do you create the best quality of life so that, you know, the next 50 years or 100 years that you have is functionally good and where you're functioning well, you're able to do things, be mobile, right? So I think those are the things which require a lot more awareness building, a lot more active engagement with people. Um, we always think we are invincible. Uh, and we always believe like, you know, your 20s, nothing break, you, you know, you get a cold and it's gone in two days. Uh, I was just saying that I had, uh, I had a cough, which should have gone in four days. It took me two weeks. Oh. But those are kind of things that happen as you slowly kind of age as well. So how do we accept it gracefully? But how do we also make sure that we take those more better choices? Because anything you do now is unfortunately only going to affect you 10 years later, right? So there's some things which governments have to come together. How do you incentivize uh, patients and uh, residents in a country, right? How do you make them take better choices? I think corporates have a strong role to play because your biggest stakeholders are your employees. You want to take care of your employees' health. So how do you make sure you have the right plans, which has preventative uh, plans included so that you go when you're 30, what plans you need to make sure, what screening you should be doing at 40, what screening you should be doing at 50. I think those are things which is very important and it doesn't happen one way. I think for it for the for our health to get better, the clap has to be with both the person taking the ownership and then you having the right health system as well in place. On the business opportunities when you talk about what's going to shift, right? For us one of the major things again is the investments into digital health. We have our one asta platform that's going live uh, in the next week. Our whole idea is if you have to do a consultation, how do you do that online? How do you make sure the doctor, once a prescription comes, uh, your medicine gets delivered at home? If there are blood tests that needs to be done, having a nurse come over to the house and collect the blood. So you actually can do that entire journey without even leaving the house, right? And whether it's post-op care, how do we kind of uh, uh, make sure you're tracking well as far as your uh, recovery is concerned? Uh, chronic disease management, this is a huge issue here because everyone's got either diabetes or hypertension. And that cannot be a episodic care. It requires us to constantly monitoring how you're performing, how you're doing. So those are things which comes into the One Asta platform. So when you look at the business opportunities within healthcare, we really believe these are the things that 
is, is showing a lot of traction right now. One of the great things about UAE also, it really is becoming a hub for such innovation. They're very keen on uh, sort of exploring what are the best ways to create the happiest city in the world, the best country in the world. Uh, recently in India, we did like a drone delivery where you could actually deliver the medicine uh, to the patient's uh, and move some blood samples across uh, different uh, locations from the airport to uh, to our hospital. So there's so much exciting things happening and that's where the business opportunities will also lie. Like I mentioned to you, uh, we have to be careful how this capital is being deployed, but I think those frugal innovations which come in, but making sure quality of care is better, the access is better, those are the ones and the ideas that's gonna win and that's gonna create magic. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you again, Alicia, for joining us here on the show. Thank you, Anu. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you here. And that's a wrap on this episode of Arabian Business in Focus. For those of you watching, don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe below for more such videos with experts in the industry. That's all for now. And until next time, goodbye.